Hey friends, this episode of The Fellow on Call is not meant to be used for medical advice and is intended for educational purposes only. Patient information has been modified to ensure privacy. The views expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect the views of our employers. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of The Fellow on Call, The Hemong Podcast. We're coming at you from Rulo University Medical Center. I'm Ronak. I'm Vivek. And I'm Dan. And in today's episode, we continue on our journey through hemolytic anemias, this time wrapping up our discussion focusing on cold agglutinins, and then a potpourri of some other acquired hemolytic anemias that we'll throw in at the end for you. This be a good episode, you know, excited to finish out this classical hematology series. I love doing these. It's, It's always fun to talk about. It's not like oncology sometimes where you have all of these phase three trials. You have to really use clinical judgment. You have to examine the patient. You have to talk to the patient. Not that you don't do that in the other cancers too, but it's less algorithmic in my opinion, and and it's very interesting. So glad we got to do this series. Yeah, me too. I mean, obviously, uh, I love a benign heme topic. <laughs> so you're not getting your complaints from me talking about this stuff. Well, without further ado then, guys, let's move on to the last of these episodes in our heme consult series for this go around. So guys, I feel like we haven't done a what are we watching session in a little bit. And so I'm obviously eagerly awaiting to hear what trashy television show Vivek is watching because I just finished what I was just watching that I'll say in a second, but I need something to turn my attention to now. So take it away. We didn't have a chance for me to say that we we did watch all of The Golden Bachelor. It was pretty good. Gary is a terrible human. I don't know if I should be saying that on a live recording, but I'm not a fan of Gary. I'm just going to be honest, not a fan of the guy. He, He made some questionable decisions there. But now I'm actually not watching something trashy. We're watching The Bear, that TV show about the chef on Hulu. Amazing TV show. I mean, it makes you anxious as you watch it. So it's hard to binge, but it's so good. Really, really, really good TV show. So highly recommend Bear on Hulu. He showed up in a series of very racy underwear commercials on New York Times recently as well. I think that was the same guy. He did. Yeah. He did a good job. I have to admit. Christine was like, hey, check out these underwear photos. I'm like, dude looks good. I mean, he's pulling it off great. Yeah, the only complaint is that he has the exact same facial expression that he has throughout the entire show. And I guess he's just staying on brand, which is that none of his face moves. So not to get too into the weeds here, what made the Golden Bachelor golden? Was he really old or really rich? That's right. He was old and I'm pretty sure rich, but it's still unclear. There's a lot of scandals that came out after. We'll link that to our show notes. It's really important for our listeners to understand the backstory of the Golden Bachelor. While we're on the topic of The Golden Bachelor, I heard on the radio the other day, because I still like to listen to the radio on the drive to work on like the rest of our generation, and they were talking about his abysmal taste in music that of all the music he chose for his wedding. The one thing that stood out, I can't remember the name of the song, but apparently the song that he chose as their first dance song is actually a breakup song. So it is, again, this adds to the questionable nature of Gary, but Hashtag I didn't watch the show, so yeah. I can't speak to anything more than that. Also, shout out to the radio. Logan and I love playing radio. It just takes all the pressure off you for picking good songs like someone else can do it. We've been watching a lot of the, in addition to the 1960s Batman, the like 90s Batman the Animated Series has been in regular rotation recently, just beautifully animated and kind of a really fun throwback. It used to be a Saturday morning staple for me when I was growing up. I can't remember if we ever mentioned, but like I binged on Ted Lasso for a little bit, very, very late to the game, but that is just what I do. And then in the nature of being late to the game, I finally finished Succession just the other day. Fantastic show. Highly recommend. It's been well over a year since Ryan Miller was on our show and first told us about Succession, or that's how I got inspired to watch it. So it took me a really long time to get there, but I'm glad I stuck through it. Really, really fantastic show. So maybe The Bear is what I'll have to turn my attention to now until the next season of Love is Blind comes out in February. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. Guys, I think we should close out our discussion today on autoimmune hemolytic anemias. And last time we talked all about warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And this time, let's turn our attention to something that a lot of people confuse with warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, but that is cold agglutinin disease. So Vivek, do you want to start us with a case for this episode? Yeah, let's do it. So we have a 72-year-old female with history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, presenting with a two-day history of progressive fatigue, dyspnea, and a lacy rash on her hands and feet. Her son, who accompanies her, states that she has had some mild scleral icterus as well. Her symptoms began when she had been 
playing with her grandson in the snow three days prior. She denies any associated dark urine or abdominal pain. She has not started any recent medications, or and she hasn't been ill recently, so no recent viral infections or anything like that. She has no fevers, weight loss, night sweats, or lymphadenopathy, no evidence of these B symptoms. Exam is consistent with mild scleral icterus, mild discoloration of her fingers, and a blanching reticulated red-blue rash on her lower extremities. She got some routine labs. The CBC was checked, which was consistent with a hemoglobin of 9.2, down from a prior baseline of approximately 13. Remember, we always look for that baseline. A CMP was performed, consistent with an elevated indirect bilirubin. Given suspicion for hemolysis, the astute provider checked a retic count, which was elevated, an LDH, which was elevated, and a haptoglobin, which was undetectable. Hematology is now consulted, given this concern for hemolytic anemia. So where do we go from here? As we talked about, there are two really important steps, given that we're concerned about hemolysis, and that's looking at the peripheral smear and getting that direct antiglobulin test, the DAT, Coombs test, to figure out, you know, to help inform our suspicion for a hemolytic process. And that's what exactly what we did. So the peripheral smear did not suggest the presence of schistocytes, but did show clumps of red blood cells. You could see agglutination on that peripheral smear, just these red blood cells all clumped together. Platelet morphology was normal in size and distribution. The white count was normal. The DAT pattern was as follows, IgG negative and C3 positive. So remember, IgG positivity is nearly always universally positive and warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, whereas C3 only positivity is more consistent with a cold picture. Given the constellation of the findings, we were concerned for this cold agglutinin disease and the fact that she'd been playing in the snow, and maybe that triggered all of this. So for starters, can you all tell me what is cold agglutinin disease? That's a really good question. And to be honest, autoimmune hemolytic anemia is super rare, as we've been alluding to in this series. But cold agglutinin disease is a rarer subset of already a rare phenomenon. So many people are honestly unfamiliar with it. I do want to point out that last week we discussed warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia as a cause of acquired hemolytic anemia. And so cold agglutinin disease is the second one of these acquired hemolytic anemias. So the big thing to remember from this is that unlike warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is going to be mediated by IgG antibodies, in cold agglutinin disease, it is IgM that is the culprit. And it's fitting that she was playing out in the snow because remember that IgM looks like snowflakes. It's this big pentamer. And so because the antibody is so large, it allows for agglutination to happen. Having agglutination on the peripheral smear can be a hallmark of this disease. And it's because the IgM that is causing the problem in this disease is targeting the big eye and little eye epitopes on your red blood cells. So the binding of IgM then allows for the activation of complement, which is ultimately what leads to the clearance of these red blood cells as the blood passes through the spleen and the Kupfer cells of the liver. These are interesting patients, right? They're not fixing complement necessarily at warm temperatures. They're fixing the complement causing this hem hemolysis at lower temperatures. So Dan, can you explain why that happens a little bit about why this is a, a cold and then also how are we diagnosing these patients, right? Yes, we can see agglutination on the peripheral smear, but how do we know if that's causing a hemolytic anemia process that we need to treat? Some of this comes down to the nature of IgM antibodies. Remember that IgM are the sort of first iteration of antibodies that are produced from our B cells before the class switch to IgG. And these are generally like high affinity, low avidity antibodies. So they don't stick as well to their targets as IgGs do. But when the average kinetic energy decreases, when things stop wiggling around as quickly, their interaction can be more consistent. And then once they do interact, they can activate complement. Typically, patients with this condition will have the sort of worst manifestation when they're exposed to cold temperature and in those areas where the temperature is coldest. And that sort of complement-mediated hemolysis, which is really, really brisk hemolysis, right? Like it's the membrane attack complex directly lysing these cells intravascularly, that causes endothelial dysfunction and vasoconstriction. And so as a result, you end up with this sort of modeling and cyanosis even in areas where this hemolysis is the most brisk. So think tip of the nose, tip of the fingers, areas that are really consistently exposed to cold. In order for this antibody to really interact, the temperature of the blood needs to be below 37. So only in the in the distal parts of the body, hopefully. So 
In addition to the normal workup that we do for hemolysis, and we've also talked about the role of the DAT in this situation, we looked at the peripheral smear, all these things are supportive of a cold agglutinin disease. Is there any additional workup that we would want to consider doing once we're pretty sure that this is cold agglutinin disease? Yeah, the important thing here is getting the thermal amplitude and figuring out what that means is when are we actually fixing complements. So we want to actually check these antibody titers at lower temperatures and then have them warm up and figure out at what temperature we're actually fixing complement. What I mean by that is you can have a cold agglutinin that's not causing active hemolysis if it's only causing hemolysis at very, very low temperatures. And you can do things like avoid cold triggers and things like that, and the, the patient can then be fine. So the thermal amplitude is going to be critically important. And the way this works is that we look at a series of temperatures, and the thermal amplitude is the highest temperature at which the IgM antibody will bind to the red blood cell antigen. Clinically significant agglutinins often have thermal amplitudes greater than about 28 to 30 degrees Celsius. While this may not impact initial management, it's really important to know because there are some patients that you can observe, right? If you're not having a thermal amplitude that's clinically significant, you don't need to expose them to unnecessary therapy. The other thing is doing serial dilutions to get the titer of the cold agglutinin. We typically think that if you can still find that cold agglutinin at multiple dilutions, then it's a stronger level that's causing a clinically significant issue. And what I mean by that is typically greater than 1 to 64. So if you have a low titer that's less than 1 to 64, then it's likely not clinically significant. And the other thing to keep in mind related to this is that when drawing labs, the specimen needs to remain body temperature greater than 37 degrees Celsius, or you're going to have an agglutinated sample and not be able to get a reliable red blood cell count. So these patients will have such a high amounts of agglutination if you just leave it at room temperature that you won't be able to get an accurate assessment of the CBC. So you have to keep the sample warm when it's coming into the lab. So you have to talk to your lab folks about how to get that done. Yeah, really important points. And part of the reason why we really need to look both at the thermal amplitude, the maximal thermal amplitude, and antibody titer is just because the titer, the idea there is to measure all of the antibody that's there. In order to catch all of that, we do that measurement really cold. It happens at four degrees Celsius. As Vivek had alluded to, maybe if their antibodies are really only binding at well below physiologic temperatures, temperatures you're not realistically not going to see in a human body, then maybe it's not clinically relevant. But if they have a high titer, you know, above one to 64, and that thermal amplitude is at conditions you could realistically see in the fingers and tips of the nose and things like that could really be a problem for the patient. This is such a strange disease. I don't know. It just seems very odd, but I guess that's sort of the nature of all these hemolytic anemias. My follow-up to that, though, is this patient had gone 72 years of her life without ever seeing any evidence of the disease. So, like, why now? Yeah, it's probably these acquired conditions. I think a majority of them are probably related to some abnormal infraproliferative process. That said, we do categorize cold agglutinin disease as either primary or secondary. Primary being something of a diagnosis of exclusion. Like once we've ruled out any sort of B cell clone or malignancy that's producing this abnormal IgM, and secondary, therefore, is related to some underlying lymphoproliferative process or underlying infection, something that we can pin down and say, okay, this is the thing that triggered this. When we're thinking about potential malignancies that could drive this, we're thinking lymphoid malignancies, something like a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and CLL can sometimes cause this, although it's more strongly associated with warm, we think about that too. Thinking about this part of the workup involves doing flow cytometry to look for a monoclonal B-cell population, doing a serum protein electrophoresis and free light chain ratio, and occasionally even a bone marrow biopsy to look and see is there some underlying condition that we could target to try and get rid of this? And I think all those components are, are very critical. And I, I just wanted to make a comment on the diagnosis of these B-cell malignancies and, and when to do a bone marrow biopsy, when to kind of search for these things. If this is a patient who has asymptomatic disease, very low titer of cold agglutinins, pursuing this workup is a little bit overkill, right? You need to watch the patient until they become clinically symptomatic or have some issue or maybe they have other B symptoms or things like that. When we look at these B-cell malignancies, they are most commonly a CD5-negative, CD10-negative 
B cell population. And your options there are marginal zone lymphoma and something called lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, which is also called Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Those are the most two common types that you see. And that's why the flow cytometry is, is pretty critical and why you can find these cells in certain areas. And these are very indolent diseases that don't necessarily need to be treated unless they become symptomatic or causing issues. The last thing I want to say morphologically the LPL, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, they look like a hybrid between a lymphocyte and a plasmacyte. They have, un by morphology, when we look at it with our eyes, they look like a lymphoplasmacytic differentiated cell. And that can be either marginal zone or this LPL Waldenstrom's picture. So that's why, again, thinking about this is important, but also not saying that just because they have this diagnosis that they're definitely going to need intensive chemotherapy or anything like that, right? We have to look at the patient in front of us, and many of these patients can have these cold agglutinin titers be asymptomatic and live with this for decades, right? It doesn't necessarily warrant treatment immediately. If we figure this out, if we figure out that a patient really does have cold agglutinin disease, what do we do to treat that? How do we manage this condition? Believe it or not, I mean, it sounds really, really silly. And I've I've seen a couple of patients with this in the hospital, but our recommendations are literally keep patient warm and provide counseling on avoiding cold exposure. And this is particularly going to be the case for the majority of the patients that'll have a mild anemia and those without very disabling pain in those acral areas that Dan was mentioning. So if blood needs to be transfused, it's important that we do consider the use of like a blood warmer. Because again, just think about how cold your patient's hospital rooms are and the rest of the hospital in general. It is very, very cold in there. So using a blood warmer to warm that blood up will help reduce the likelihood that it's going to break down. This is critically important, and this is why things like the thermal amplitude is super important, because if a patient is going to undergo a surgery, either that at hospital admission or in the future, this needs to be a conversation that the hematologist has with the surgical team, because Again, the OR is a very cold place. If they're going to be using bypass machines and things like that, that can really decrease the temperature of the patient's body and lead to severe complications intraoperatively. In general, steroids do not help these patients. And in fact, steroids result in remission in only about not even 20% of patients. So really, there isn't much utility there. Splenectomy also doesn't really help because there's still hemolysis that can take place in the liver as well. So you're subjecting these patients to an unnecessary surgery that isn't really going to change their ultimate outcome. In addition to that, going hand in hand with that, remember splenectomy is a big surgery. Splenectomies can also increase patients' risk of thrombosis. And on top of that, like warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias, there is an increased risk of thrombosis. So prophylaxis should be initiated for these patients in the absence of the need for therapeutic doses of anticoagulation. And remember, we're thinking about predominantly complement-mediated destruction of red cells. So unless they have a splenic lymphoma, like splenectomy is really not going to get you much. So Dan, if the patient, though, is symptomatic and we need to consider doing some more definitive treatment, what is sort of your approach as to how you go about taking care of these patients? It's varied depending on what the underlying cause is, of course, but there's actually a good How I Treat article on, on cold gluten disease that we'll have a link to in our show notes as well. But remember, there's often going to be a monoclonal B cell population of some variety driving this process. Like in warm, B cell directed therapies are going to be kind of a backbone of your treatment. That said, this tends to happen in older patients, again, thinking about this being driven by B cell malignancy. And so you don't want to go super aggressive with your therapies. But I tend to like basically rituximab and monotherapy is my first line. In fact, I've had patients who I treat with rituximab just once a month over the course of the winter, and it seems to help keep them suppressed. But doing a, a course of rituximab to try and beat down that B cell population that's causing this trouble is the biggest thing. And I, you kind of monitor titers as you go through that therapy. If somebody doesn't have a lot of comorbidities and you think they could tolerate a little bit more intensive therapy, particularly if you have a proven underlying sort of B-cell clone driving this, reaching for something like bendamustine in combination with rituximab is also an option. Thinking about that as something that's just going to even further decrease the level of that B-cell clone that's driving the process. That comes with some cytopenias. There are some other side effects with bendamustine that need to be kept in mind, but that's another option out there. There are some second line things you can do too. I'm looking at the BTK inhibitor ibrutinib or tezomib, as we had talked about in later line warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia treatment. And particularly since bortezomib can also help with 
things like hyperviscosity and Waldenstrom's, you know, this is going to be an effective therapy in targeting cells that produce antibodies. And to just piggyback off that and to comment on it from a lymphoma perspective and in a lymphoma perspective, when we think about these patients, I highly advocate for rituxan monotherapy as first line, right? It's very reasonable to try that. If it works, great, you're done, right? You spared them an alkylator like bendamustine. There are only single center studies in this space. You can do bendamustine rituximab for four cycles, so four months of therapy, high sustained CR rates with that, and likely those patients had an underlying marginal zone lymphoma or an underlying lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, also known as Waldenstrom's. When we think about these patients and we're trying to determine when to start the bendamustine, I would advocate for doing a bone marrow biopsy to know what you're dealing with. Here's why. We have newer generation BTK inhibitors that are better than abrutinib in terms of cardiac side effect profiles. In a patient who's got underlying marginal zone or LPL, we now have things like xanabrutinib that we can give, reduce the risk of atrial fibrillation. There are some patients who you might be worried about giving them bendamustine rituximab. It requires GCSF support in many patients who are older due to high rates of grade 3, 4 neutropenia. And it's not saying that you need to treat them, but it's at least knowing what your diagnosis is and knowing that you do have alternative options to bendamustine rituximab in that patient who may not be able to tolerate that, that elderly 75-year-old who may be a borderline candidate that you could put on something like a BTK inhibitor and get good, durable responses in that patient. So there's no right or wrong answer. I would say that something like a Velcade is way, way lower on what we use in these patients. Directing at B-cell malignancies, particularly something like a rituxan-based regimen or a BTK inhibitor are definitely the ways to go. And you know, fortunately, our patient was not particularly symptomatic, right? She had this episode when she was out in the cold playing in the snow with her grandson. But some patients can really present with brisk hemolysis. Remember, complement-mediated conditions tend to be ones to really fear. Because this is a complement-mediated disease, has there been any work looking at complement inhibition for these patients? It's a really, really good question. And honestly, until 2022, our treatment options were very, very limited in this space. But thankfully, in that time frame, there were two large studies, one the Cardinal study and one the Cadenza study, where both performed, and this led to the approval of a complement inhibitor called citimlimab. And the way that this drug works is that it blocks the C1S portion of the complement cascade. And so recall that this is part of the classical complement pathway. Again, I never thought I would ever have to think about the classical complement cascade again after medical school, but here we are. Essentially, it blocks that first pivotal step in triggering this whole process. And this drug in the US, therefore, became approved for patients with significant hemolysis. The caveat here, as we've been alluding to, is that the underlying driver in this disease is usually a monoclonal B-cell population. And so this drug is sort of a bandage. It helps temporize the acute situation, prevent any further hemolysis from happening. But thereafter, there is often going to be some effort to both identify what that monoclonal B-cell population is, if one exists, and treat it as such. You will see some differences in how people utilize this drug. Some people will keep this drug going kind of indefinitely on their patients. Some will use it just to temporize the acute situation and then transition to some more definitive therapy like we talked about with rituximab and such. Thankfully, our patient did well with just supportive care. So remember, many of these patients don't need bendamustine rituximab or rituxan therapy. You got to look at the patient, look at the trajectory of their counts, see if they're symptomatic. And she had a workup that was suggestive of a small B-cell clone, and she had an IgM kappa M-spike at 0.6, and she declined a bone marrow biopsy, but really she fit with this lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma Waldenstrom's picture at that point. We don't have the definitive diagnosis. Another marker that will lead you to this LPL Waldenstrom's is looking for a mutation in MYD88, MYD88 is another thing that kind of helps you, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a future episode. Sorry, I keep on talking about lymphoma. But although she's sad that she has to avoid playing in the snow with her grandson, she understands why it's so important, and she actually says, hey, I like staying indoors, making s'mores by the fire anyway, and she has done beautifully for several years, not needing any treatment. She's just following up in our clinics. 
So we've covered a lot over the last three weeks. We've gone through the crash course of hemolytic anemias. We've talked about the workup, congenital causes, notably G6PD deficiency in that discussion, as well as others in our bonus episode. We talked about warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and now we we finished off with the cold agglutinin disease. We're thinking about closing with a few other examples of acquired hemolytic anemias. Let's talk about these, but we're going to go very briefly in round-robin style so we don't bore our listeners. And note, listeners, we'll have separate episodes discussing these again. We just wanted to mention them now. So let's start with this. So one of you guys, can you talk about paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria? Yeah, so I'll start off with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or PNH. It's a really interesting pathogenesis. Basically, there's an acquired genetic defect. It leads to a loss of an anchor protein in happens at the hematopoietic stem cell level. And the downstream effect of losing that anchor protein is you lose the things that are attached to it, including CD55 and CD59, which are two membrane surface complement inhibitors. You end up getting complement mediated hemolysis from all the cells that are born from that uh, defective hematopoietic stem cell. And we'll talk about that more in detail in a future episode, because there's a lot to talk about there. But suffice to say, you get intermittent brisk hemolysis from complement mediated red cell destruction. Yep. And remember, we send flow on the red blood cells looking for the loss of CD55 and CD59 to diagnose that condition. Rona, can you tell us a little bit about spur cell anemia? Yeah. So spur cell anemia, we unfortunately do see in the hospital quite frequently. And this is most commonly going to be in your patients with severe liver disease. Usually the patients I've seen this in have end-stage cirrhosis, unfortunately. So spur cells, or another term for that is those acanthocytes, have these irregular projections that come out of the cell. And we'll have a picture of this in our show notes if you haven't seen this before. But this can cause profound hemolysis in patients with advanced liver disease. And unfortunately, without fixing the liver, supportive care is the best that we can do for these patients. And the presence of spur cell anemia has actually been correlated with increased risk of mortality, often, again, without fixing the underlying problem, which in many of these cases is a dysfunctional liver. There's only so much that can be done to reverse the effects of the spur cell anemia. And I feel like that's one of the tougher conditions to diagnose. Like Ronak said, you look at the smear and hemolytic anemia, if you think about an autoimmune hemolytic anemia in a cirrhotic patient, that's really hard to diagnose. Sometimes we just do our best. We say their retics are way up. They've got this positive DAT. Let's just give it a shot if we don't see a ton of spur cells and treat empirically. And many times they get better. Their haptoglobin is always undetectable. They likely have an elevated LDH because they're really sick. So it's so hard. I want to finish off with medication-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So Dan, do you want to take that one? This is just a demonstrative of why it's important to always do a good med rec and medication reconciliation to make sure that you get all the possible influence that could be contributing to hemolysis. Some of the most notorious culprit agents are antibiotics, including the penicillins and cephalosporins, also some sulfonamide antibiotics and tetracyclines. Briefly, there are a few different ways that you can get hemolysis with a drug. Either they can act as a haptin and coat the RBC surface in coordination with other proteins, and that results in either opsonization, phagocytosis, or uh, complement activation. The drug can also bind a carrier protein and trigger antibody formation that way, so another sort of haptin-mediated process. And then if there's cross-reactivity between that antibody that's produced and the RBCs, you can get a sort of drug-induced immune hemolysis that way. Lastly, there are some drugs that, even without complexing with native proteins, can form autoantibodies or can trigger the formation of autoantibodies, and those antibodies then can cross-react with RBC surface proteins, causing another mechanism of immune-mediated drug-induced hemolysis. Yeah, and Dan, you know, I think that's one of the harder things to diagnose, this medication-induced hemolytic anemia. In some of these cases, like you said, you kind of need the drug present for this hemolysis to occur. And when you run that DAT test, it may be negative, and you're still having this hemolytic anemia picture. You have to take a very careful medication history. And for those patients who need long-term antibiotics for bacteremia or maybe from some osteomyelitis or something like that, that's when you might want to actually look, send special testing for a drug 
induced antibodies against these red blood cells and things like that because it can really inform your antibiotic choice. And always, you know, an empiric trial of, of switching the therapy is very reasonable if, if the time makes sense and you can't figure out another reason. And again, you all listeners have heard our discussions about these congenital cases, so you know how to kind of sift through this. But like Dan said, there's a lot of mechanisms. You might have a negative DAT and it's still caused by that drug because you need the drug present to have this issue happening. It's, a, it's an important part of the hemolytic reaction. All right, listeners, I think that was a, a really good foray into hemolytic anemias. I'll leave it to Ronick and Dan to close us out for this episode. I just want to reiterate what we've been saying in all these episodes. If you see an acute drop in hemoglobin, try to rule out bleeding first. Make sure you go through all the questions that we highlighted, including questions about bleeding, and then of course, questions that can support hemolysis. And if those are suggestive that hemolysis may be a part of the picture, undergo a hemolysis workup because that DAT, although can be supportive of a patient with hemolytic anemia, remember that seven to 8% of patients can have positive DATs even without any clinical evidence of hemolysis. So it's not a good idea to go just willy-nilly ordering labs. That's my takeaway. I have two closing points. One is after you've ruled out bleeding, start thinking to yourself as you're working up for hemolysis, how is this patient's liver doing? The liver produces haptoglobin. The liver is chock full of LDH. There basically are a lot of, th and of course, bilirubin goes up in liver disease. So pretty much all of our markers for hemolysis can be confounded by liver disease. Keep that in mind. The other thing is, if you have a patient with cold agglutinin disease, keep them warm. It doesn't just mean putting on a sweater, right? We're trying to keep all the various different extremities warm. So putting on something to cover their face when they're out in, in the cold, putting on gloves, make sure they understand that wherever their body gets cold, hemolysis can happen. But yeah, I think we really have covered a lot. I'm, I'm happy with this. So until next time, peace, everybody. See you later. See you later. See you later.